Hello, 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 and welcome to Capturing Christianity. My name is Cameron Bertuzzi. Today we're talking about Pilate. Do, do the gospel accounts, or does the Bible portray Pilate uh, as a little bit too nice? Is he too nice? At, at least with respect to how Pilate is portrayed in other works, other non-biblical works. That's what we're talking today uh, with Mark Turnage, who is relatively new on the on the YouTube apologetic scene or in the biblical scene. Uh, he's been doing this for a while, and he's actually a New Testament scholar. He's even working on his PhD right now. But this is uh, one of the first times he's been introduced, uh, being introduced to uh, YouTube. So uh, welcome, Mark. It's it's so good to have you here. We talked a little this morning about your internet presence and how I'm hoping that uh, this will be the start of your work getting a little bit more exposure. So thanks so much for, for coming on. Thanks for having me, Cameron. I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah, so uh, I, I did want to let you guys know that uh, on the technical side of things, his connection is a little bit choppy, So, but you'll, you should still be able to hear everything that we've got to say uh, in this interview today. So again, we're talking about Pilate and whether or not he's portrayed as a little bit too nice in the Gospels. Maybe the, the Gospel writers took some liberties here and there. That's what we're talking about today. So let's start with this. Let's start at the beginning. So Mark, why don't you uh, just tell the audience a little about who you are, the kind of work that you do, some of your background, because as I say, most of uh, our audience won't know who you are. So tell us who you are. Well, um, I'm originally from the Midwest, uh, but after finishing my BA, I moved to Israel where I lived for seven years doing my master's and doctoral studies. And while living there, I became passionate about using the world of the Bible to help Bible readers understand the words of the Bible. And um, in the course of my time there, I began leading trips to Israel and the West Bank and Jordan and Egypt and Italy and Greece and Turkey, and really just taking people through the Bible lands and using the Bible lands as a window to help them understand how by being in these three dimensional settings, they can better understand the words of the Bible. And so I've been doing that for about 25 years. I've taught at the university level, both at the undergraduate and the graduate level. And uh, about six years ago, I launched uh, a new company where we do both travel experiences to the lands of the Bible that really focus in on, again, not just taking you to see the sites, but using the world of the Bible to understand its words. But then also we have launched a digital learning platform, curriculum, courses, online Bible study, and so forth as a way to, again, help people look and peer through the various contexts of the world of the Bible so that they can better understand its words. One of the things I'm most excited about uh, talking you talking with you today is I, I went to Israel myself, my wife and I, a few years ago at this point, and just going there, and I can see why you would have wanted to just move over there and just be there for a while. I can totally understand. I totally understand how you're like taking trips and you just you just want to be in that land. There's something about it. it's weird. It's really weird. Uh, but one of the things I'm most yeah. excited about talking with you about is the fact that like when you go over there and you actually experience what it's like to be in that land, it's a completely different experience than what than just like reading your Bible, opening it up, because those are the actual places that they're talking about. And it's just it's almost surreal in a lot of ways as, a, as an American living over here in the States or it doesn't matter where you are. If you're not in that land, it's just it's just, it's very, very surreal. But I'm also just excited to, to talk with you about uh, some of the things that you're really passionate about. One of the things that you're passionate about is that uh, Christian origins around that time. What, mm -hmm. How does the, you know, the biblical text, how, the, how do they differ? How are they uh, verisimilitudinous? Is that, the, is that the right word to use there? How are they similar to other uh, ancient sources? And uh, so that's, I'm really excited to talk about Pilate today. I was listening to one of the podcast episodes that you sent me on your podcast, Windows into the Bible, and it was just really eye-opening. I, I really like to listen to podcast episodes or podcasts, historical podcasts, that kind of like tell a story. And it's like, you know, this is what was going on. These are the sources that we're using. And according to Josephus, according to uh, all of these other people, this is how we know that these events took place. And this is the way that they recorded them. Some scholars differ here and there on these little bits and, and pieces there. So it's just a very... 
uh, not not only is it a, a good you're, you're a good storyteller, but you also are very fair. I feel like you you let the audience know when something is sort of contentious or not. And uh, you're like, yeah, we already know that this person exists or these other sources, but we also have this archaeological evidence. So I really appreciate that about uh, the way that you talk and the way that you work. So I'm really excited for the audience to really uh, appreciate that today and then hopefully go and find more of your work and uh, other things that you're doing. And, and as I mentioned in our phone call this morning, I'd like to do uh, a, a, as much work with you as as we can. Your work is just, uh, it's really great. Okay, so let's get into it. How? Where should we start? Maybe maybe the best place to start is what what are the Bible sort what are the biblical sources say about Pilate, and then we'll turn to the non biblical or non Christian sources, and then see sort of what the the surface level conflict is, and then maybe some of the solutions that you've got or or what your thoughts on it are. So let's start with the biblical accounts. Well, I think that even before we jump in there, I, I, the one that I would frame out, I think that when we read the Bible. We need to understand that we often read it within a vacuum. We read it within our world and within our context. And it's like with reading the Gospels, let's say when you read, for example, a play of Shakespeare. Now, obviously you can read it and you can understand it. But if we understand what is going on in the Elizabethan culture of the world of Shakespeare, the politics, the debates, the issues, it actually sheds light on how Shakespeare's audience would have heard and interpreted Shakespeare. Now, the same thing's true when we come to talking about the Gospels, because we tend to read the Gospels detached from the historical and cultural world in which their original audience read them in. And therefore, when we read them, we find Pilate and we get this kind of presentation of Pilate that we find repeated often within Christian uh, teaching, preaching, and so forth, kind of the good old Pilate who really didn't want to kill Jesus, who um, was a good guy, but just was a weak and weak-minded And therefore, he kind of gets steamrolled by the Jewish leadership who ramrods through their agenda to crucify Jesus. And my thought and what I think and where I think that the extra biblical sources, both literary and archaeological, really bring um, clarity is that they fill out that world and they actually can help us to reframe even the character of Pilate that we find in the Gospels, where we're not sitting here saying that he has been completely recreated by the Gospel writers, and that there's this void between what we hear about him in, say, Josephus, the first century Jewish historian, or Philo of Alexandria, And here's what we find in the Gospels. But I actually think that there's a bridge that we can understand once we begin to hear the Gospels within that greater historical and cultural echo chamber. The other thing I think that's important for us to never forget when we read the Gospels, the Gospel writers are writing biographies of the life of Jesus that carry a certain subversive tone. I mean, let's be honest, they're saying that this individual, this Jewish man who lived on the eastern edge of the Roman Empire, who was crucified as an enemy of the Roman state, is the son of God. And therefore, that plays into how they're going to um, handle and try and navigate the telling of that story because being a follower of Jesus, where you're saying that we are, in effect, um, proclaiming the potential end of the Roman Empire, it's a little bit politically subversive. And so you have to navigate those challenges in uh, a careful way. And I think we see that going on within the gospel writers. 
So then how, because I was listening to your, your episode on Pilot and what was what was so striking to me is that your, was it your professor who, who mentioned that Pilot was like, mm-hmm. his nickname for him was The Butcher? And you definitely don't get right. that impression when you read the gospel accounts, right? He seems kind of, like you said, timid and kind of like steamrolled by these Jewish leaders, right. especially Caiaphas. So uh, tell us about the, the non-biblical sources and how they may differ in certain ways, or at least on the surface they differ. Okay, so... Our primary sources about Pilate, even within the ancient world, are the first century Jewish historian Josephus Flavius, who, when he goes to talking about the Roman governors of the province of Judea, he spills more ink on Pilate than anyone else. The other is Philo of Alexandria, who mentions him briefly um, in a work that is uh he sends uh, to Gaius Caligula, one of the Roman emperors. The other details or evidence that we have about him comes to us from archaeology. We actually have coins that were minted by Pilate or under Pilate's uh, governorship uh, in the land of Israel. And then we also have an inscription that was found in the harbor city of Caesarea, Uh, which is on the coast of the land of Israel. It was the major seat of the Roman government in the land of Israel in the first century. Now, what we find from Pilate in these sources, let's start with Josephus. Josephus tells a number of stories, actually about three, where Pilate routinely is doing things to antagonize his Jewish subjects. For example, he brings standards into Jerusalem bearing the image of the emperor, something that was a no-no, especially in the holy city of Jerusalem. And the Jews go to Caesarea, where Pilate is living, uh, and protest this. And he basically gets ready to unleash his army upon them, but they, by their endurance, ready to die rather than back down, cause him to back down. On another instance, though, Pilate actually takes the sacred monies from the temple treasury, what is called korban, the money that was given for the sacrifices. And um, he uses this money supposedly to build an aqueduct into Jerusalem. Again, the Jewish people kind of speak out against this, and Pilate stations his guards, his soldiers, dressed up in plain clothes throughout this Jewish mob, and at his prearranged signal, they basically open up and begin to beat people to death, killing people, even people that weren't a part of the protest got swept up into this. And then finally, we even hear Josephus saying that Pilate Um, The reason why he's eventually removed from power is because the Samaritans were gathering on their holy mountain, Mount Gerizim, that we read about also in the New Testament. And Pilate sends his forces there and once again slaughters them. So we get this idea where he has this extreme brutality. And he tends to respond with such brutality to any kind of challenge to his authority and leadership. And so that's what we find within Josephus. Now, Philo's testimony parallels Josephus's, but Philo is going to tell us a couple of other details. Number one, Pilate often was known to be taking financial bribes. Number two, he was known to execute people without due process. And one of the things when we really look at the gospel accounts of the death of Jesus, there is no Roman trial of Jesus, just like there's really no Jewish trial of Jesus. What's done is kind of done behind closed doors, out of the sight of people, and it actually fits what Philo says that he was want to execute people without due process. So we see this sign of Pilate reflected in these two Jewish authors where he exercised brutality in order to govern and achieve his means. The other thing that we see here, though, is a certain degree of an exaggerated devotion 
to the emperor. And the emperor at this time is Tiberius. And that also gets borne up when we look at the coins that Pilate meant and this inscription from Caesarea. Yeah, let's talk more about the exaggerated devotion to Titus. Is it Titus or Ti Tiberius? Uh, so Tiberius. So one of the one of my worries concerns with with that is is that we're basically attributing some kind of like psychological state to to Pilate, and that seems uh, a little suspect. Like we shouldn't try to be psychoanalyzing people who lived, you know, in the first century. But so so uh, lessen my concern here. Why why is this not a concern? Or how do how do okay, we know that? How so do we know that he's 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 got all this devotion to Tiberius? Okay, so the inscription that was discovered in Caesarea was found by an Italian team of archaeologists in the 1960s. It was actually a stone that was being used in a remodel of the theater in, in Caesarea um, that took place in the uh, late 2nd, early 3rd century AD. Um, and when they turned it over, they found this inscription, which is the dedication of a small Tiberium, which is a small temple to Tiberius. Now, I think most of us are familiar with the fact that in the Roman Empire, the emperors came to be worshipped as de and be deified, worshipped as gods, the sun god, etc., but what's interesting to note, Tiberius is the second emperor of the Roman Empire. Of course, the first is Augustus. And we really only begin with Augustus deifying his adopted father, Julius Caesar, um, with this kind of deification of emperors. But for Romans, they were only deified upon their death. And what's interesting is the Roman historian Suetonius tells us that Tiberius actually questioned the cult of emperor worship. Now, where all this comes together within this inscription is we have Pilate, a Roman governor who therefore was a Roman citizen, dedicating a small temple to Tiberius who was a living emperor. This is unheard of in the Roman world. Now, you hear, for example, Herod the Great. This is the Herod that we read about in Matthew chapter 2, that he built three temples to Augustus while Augustus was emperor. That was a sign of his fidelity and his devotion. He was not a Roman citizen. That was something that was encouraged in the provinces outside of Rome. But for Pilate, as a Roman citizen to do this to Tiberius is unheard of. Now, scholars have wrestled with why does he do this. Some have suggested that he does this in light of uh, an uprising that takes place in the time of Tiberius's imperial reign, where Tiberius kind of just leaves Rome and goes off to his palace on the island of Capri and leaves the administration of his empire to this figure we know as Sejanus. Um, if you've ever seen the BBC series, I, Claudius, it was played by a young Pat, uh, Sejanus was played by a young Patrick Stewart. Anyway, this is, um, he's just soci he's a sociopath. And so eventually Tiberius has to remove him. And so some scholars have suggested maybe this exaggerated devotion of Pilate comes after this time period of Sejanus's reign of terror. And it's Pilate's way of, again, showing his devotion. We also see this, though, in his coins. The coins that Pilate mints carry certain pagan symbols on them. Now, this is, again, unique because we find other coins that the Roman governors of Judea minted. They don't carry pagan symbols on them. Pilots do. But what's also important to note is not only do they carry pagan symbols, but these symbols are connected to the cult of emperor worship and to Tiberius and his mother, um, uh, Livia Julius. And so 
what this gives us a window into is a bit of the psychology. And I agree with you. It's kind of hard for us to psychoanalyze people that lived 2,000 years ago. But the fact that we do have these external sources that really raise the question, why is he doing this? And in fact, Tiberius doesn't want this, according at least to the Roman historian Suetonius, then it seems to suggest that Pilate has this exaggerated devotion to the emperor that we don't find anyone else exercising. And I will draw your attention to the fact that in the Gospels, when the chief priests want to really finally nail Pilate down on crucifying Jesus, they make the statement, if you do not do this, you are no friend of Caesar's. This is an individual that wants that friendship. Hmm. So how does that how does that play in? What is there is there really any relevance? Uh, the exaggerated what is it called? I, I completely forgot the term devotion. exaggerated devotion to Tiberius. Does that play any part in uh, the, the differences between the gospel portrayal of Pilate and the non the non biblical sources? Is that is that really super relevant here? Or is it just a, a sort of interesting fact of history? I, I think it is relevant, and, and the reason I think that it's relevant is because often a person who has that need to ingratiate themselves to the positions of power do so from a certain psychological weakness. One of the things that we find throughout history is people that reflect that need to ingratiate themselves to power when they're put in a position of power, they often compensate for that weakness with a certain level of brutality. And that's exactly what we see happening with Pilate. And more than that, I think that we need to keep in mind something, and it's a question that no one really asks when it comes to Jesus's crucifixion. Why is Pilate crucifying anyone in connection with the Jewish festival of Passover? Passover was the festival of liberty, redemption, freedom. It's the Jewish 4th of July. And what, what in effect Pilate is doing is he's executing individuals who according to the Gospels, belong to those streams of Jewish thought that had a certain militant um, idea to them, that it is a sin for us to submit to Roman authority, and therefore we are going to take up the sword and we're going to fight. Those are the individuals. That's Barabbas. Those are the two other thieves that are on the cross. And in effect, what Pilate is doing is the Jewish people have just celebrated the festival of redemption. And he says, listen, I'm going to remind you who is, who's still in charge here by executing here these individuals that, in a sense, are symbolic of your hopes and aspirations of redemption. And the Gospels tell us that Barabbas had stirred up the the population that he had upset the stasis, uh, which means that he's a rebel rouser. And he had been involved in altercations with the Romans. And therefore, it makes real sense why Pilate would want to target him. He doesn't see Jesus as perfectly innocent because he says, look, I'll have him beaten and then released. But notice once Pilate agrees to execute Jesus, he then becomes a party of this mock coronation that we find with Jesus in the Gospels. The, the sign that he puts on Jesus's cross, which Jesus would have worn around his neck at the point of execution, is not a profession of faith by Pilate but it's his openly mocking of Jewish hopes of redemption. And so we get him even now becoming participant within um, this mocking of Jesus as well and what he represents in terms of 
uh, Judaism's hopes of redemption. And so I do think that it's important because we see both sides of Pilate as we read the Gospels, like I said, within that kind of historical and cultural context. On the one hand, we see this figure who can be manipulated and who has a certain weakness that he is going to acquiesce to the, the chief priests. But on the other hand, we see this side of him that reflects this brutality. And I think that the bridge between this is this individual who expresses this exaggerated devotion to the emperor that leads him to do things that no other Roman citizen, at least that we have record of in the literary or archaeological sources does. So I want to now bring in another key player in all of this. And uh, so, so Caiaphas, the high priest Caiaphas. So it seems like mm -hmm. I, it, on the surface, and I'm going to need your help to help clear this up, is that it seems like there's a kind of con a conflict here, not a contradiction. But so Pilate seems to, to have turmoil with the Jews or be in turmoil with the Jews. Like there's, there's a, a kind of like... Uh, not a very friendly relationship between the two of them. And you even told some of the stories and even in your podcast, you mentioned the same stories and how, you know, he sent out these people disguised and then he beat them up and killed a, a lot of them and stuff. So it seems like there's like, it's not a very uh, good relationship between Pilate and the Jews. However, it seems like the the lead Jew, the, lead, the high priest Caiaphas and Pilate were kind of like in cahoots. Like they were... Uh, BFS almost as it, as it were, and you even talk about that in your podcast. Is that like he seemed the the reign of Caiaphas seems to coincide with the reign of Pilate, and so it seems like there was some kind of uh, relationship that they had going on there, which may explain also why Pilate acquiesced because they already had this kind of relationship. So just let's talk about Caiaphas and the 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 points of overlap and and how he might be important to to all of this. Well, I think that first of all we need to talk about the fact that. Judaism and Jews in the first century were um, variant. There were streams of Jewish piety. And when we talk about once Rome annexes the territory that Jerusalem resided in, and this happens in AD 6, when that happens and that territory comes under the direct Roman rule of governors, Roman governors. The go-between between the Roman administration of the province and the Jewish people, particularly in Jerusalem and because of the temple that's there, is going to be the chief priestly families of Jerusalem. And these individuals we know from not only the New Testament, but also from Josephus. We know it from rabbinic sources. We even hear about them in the Dead Sea Scrolls. These individuals, the best way I could describe them is in the singular term mafia. They are not hurting under Roman rule. In fact, one of my favorite places to take groups in Jerusalem are some of the homes that have been excavated of these high priestly families. Now, one of the homes in particular is over 6,000 square feet. That's big by our standards. These people in their homes, they have mosaic floors, they have beautiful frescoed walls, they have crown molding in their ceilings. They are not suffering under Roman occupation. They're thriving under it. And one of the things that we find the ancient sources consistently saying about them is the fact that they also would use a certain level of brutality in order to hold on to their power. Because one thing that we know about the Jerusalem temple is that it was the wealthiest temple in all of the Roman world. And they're sitting on top of this. In fact, we even hear at times that they would so escalate the cost of sacrifices that people who would come to worship in Jerusalem could not even afford the sacrifice for the festival. They were not suffering under Roman occupation. And one of the things, when you go back to looking at Josephus's stories, the two in particular about the standards in Jerusalem 
and also about him taking the temple treasury money, the core bond. Who gave him access to that? Where did he gain that access? More than that, the chief priests should have been the ones leading the charge of protesting him bringing the standards of the emperor into Jerusalem, but they're not there. We also find that when Pilate is ultimately removed from power, so is Caiaphas. And so we find this group that both the book of Acts and Josephus tell us are tied to this group we hear of as the Sadducees. They are a priestly aristocracy of Jerusalem. And it is in their best interest for Rome to be in power because they're benefiting it from it financially and they're in a real position of power. And when Jesus of Nazareth rides into Jerusalem and he has this event we call the temple cleansing, but it's really not about the temple. It's about those who are selling in the temple. It's what Luke says. He, in effect, is pointing the finger at these guys and saying, you're corrupt, and because of your corruption, you are going to be judged by God. What happens is because of Jesus' popularity with the crowds, throughout that last week, these, this group, the chief priests, their scribes, and Sadducean authorities are trying to lay hands on him, but they can't because of his popularity with the people. And remember, when do they come out to arrest him? At night. Why at night? So he's, they're out. They're doing it out of the eyesight of the people because the people were on Jesus' side. But this is who these guys are. He was a threat to their power and their money. And it's always three, right? Power, sex, or money. And we've got two of the three here. And... We see that throughout human history of how people will do very heinous acts in order to protect that. And so we see this relationship, this very unholy relationship with Caiaphas Pilate. And it plays out with what we see going on in the gospel text. One of the questions I had this is completely off, off topic. One of the questions I had was, does he just talk like this? Does he does he never use any filler words? And it's true. You don't. You don't use any filler words. I haven't heard one um or ah or <laughs> anything. It's like I don't know how you do it. I wish I wish I were that good. Uh well, at least I've got that question answered. That's that's really cool. Um all right, that that aside, where where should we go for So do you see that the, I mean You've already talked about this and you've kind of explained it a little bit, but how? what's like the best way to reconcile the non-biblical accounts and the biblical accounts or the, the portrayal of Pilate? Is it just to say that, well, in the in the biblical accounts, we actually have both. It's not just one you know, or the other. It's not just that he's nice. He also hung the thing around his neck at the time of crucifixion, so he was a participant. Is it is that kind of your answer that it's, it's a more nuanced approach instead of just being like, okay, this... Betrayal of Pilate in the in the biblical accounts is just this really nice guy who's kind of timid and like didn't want to do it, but actually like in the in the end he did end up like doing some bad things, and so it, it does sort of paint a full picture. Even if it paints a different side of it, we still have uh, a big picture nonetheless. And I'm sure that like you know the these non biblical accounts they're they're highlighting they're not telling every single thing that Pilate did ever right? They're telling just like the right. highlights, the things that were really important historically. So there probably were times when he did something that on the surface would have looked nice or lo would have looked timid, but maybe those things, uh, some of those things didn't make it into the accounts because they weren't as important. So that to me is, is just sort of the way to, to do this. And I kind of, <laughs> I may have answered it for you, but what, how, yeah, what, what else do you want to say about the, all of this? And then, oh, oh I, I did want to mention, yeah. we're going to do some, some, uh, some Q and a with Mark here in just okay. a few minutes. So if you've got a question for Mark uh, related to the topic of pilot and the biblical accounts and the, the portrayal, um, anything related to that, we can go a little bit outside of that, but I want to try to stay pretty close to on topic today. So if you've got a question, write it down in the live chat. I will be taking those uh, or paying attention to those as Mark answers this question here. I think that there's a couple of things that, that become important here. First of all, both Josephus and the Roman author Cornelius Tacitus, as well as all of the early creeds of the church, 
lay the blame of Jesus's death at the feet of Pilate. And I think we need to keep that in, 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 in frame of reference with all this. I think that what often happens is when we begin to enter into the world of the Bible, which is really what reading these extra biblical sources is enabling us to do. And, and I love your word, Cameron, it's nuance. We gain nuance. We gain historical nuance. We gain cultural nuance. And when it comes to this issue of the death of Jesus, who is responsible for that? I think that this is very important. This is more than just a historical exercise because within the history of Christendom, much has been perpetrated against the Jews because of a lack of historical nuance. And just like if we're going to read any historical accounts, documents, sources, of which the Bible is a part, we need to step back into that world and always be very careful not to impose our worldview or our readings of this back into it. Now, again, we all bring our assumptions to things, but by entering the world and by reading Josephus, by reading Philo, by looking at the archaeology, that enables us to begin to soften maybe some of our presuppositions and gain that nuance to read these sources in that way. And I do think that it's important, and I think it's more than just a, a historical exercise, especially when it comes to this particular issue of those responsible uh, for the death of Jesus. All right, we did have some questions come in. And actually before that, it would because questions are still coming in. So if you have another question for Mark that you want to ask him, and again, we can go a little bit off topic. Anything related really to the origins of Christianity would be fair game today. That's his specialty or one of his specialties, ex expertise, areas of expertise, uh, however you want to say it. But I want to give you a chance to talk about your uh, your company, the, thing that, the things that you've got going on. You've got two things to talk about. And uh, as we're, again, compiling the questions to, to ask, I want to give you some opportunity to talk about that. So uh, let everyone know what you got going on, because it's really important stuff, really good. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm ac actually excited to, uh, to start doing it myself. So uh, go ahead. Well, we um, the company is called Biblical Expeditions. We, of course, do travel experiences to the lands of the Bible. Um, and... Our travel experiences are really unlike anything that's out there, both in terms of expertise and access, but also service. But the whole purpose of our trips is to use the world of the Bible to help travelers understand the words of the Bible better. To that end, we also have what we call the Windows into the Bible University. And here we have college level and seminary level courses on all different kinds of topics. We have a theology of Jesus. What is the Bible? Um, sailing the wine dark sea with Paul. So it's looking at Paul's second missionary journey. We have a course that we've done in the letters to the seven churches that John writes in the book of Revelation. And the whole purpose of these courses is, again, this idea of entering into the contextual worlds of the Bible to better understand the words of the Bible. And we have both annual, monthly subscriptions on that. You can even just buy individual courses. Courses are being added all the time, um, being taught by not just myself, but other um, world-renowned uh, biblical scholars and teachers, archaeologists, and so forth. And then we've also got a uh, monthly um, Bible study and book club. We take a book of the Bible, we read it, we're going through the Gospel of Luke right now, it's on demand, so you don't have to stay up with the group, but part of it is you receive the notes in addition to the three times a week, the Bible study, that have the ancient sources, the archaeology, the maps, and then twice a month, we come together in a live event for um, the book that we're reading. Because in addition to studying a book of the Bible, we also read 
uh, a book that gives background on the world of the Bible. So that's that's pretty much the, what our company does and what we're doing and really just trying to transform and um, use the world of the Bible to make better disciples. Where can people go to sign up and, and be part of all this? We'll go to windowsintothebibleuniversity.com. Perfect. All right. That's easy. And you've got both the devotional and the, also the courses there as well? Yes. Perfect. All right. Let's get to some questions. We've had a few come in and I'm really excited to ask them. Some of these are, are really, really good. So let's start. Uh, this is a recent one that's come in. Pla- Placidus? Pla- 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 I don't know. Uh, how did the Romans react to the empty tomb? Somewhat related. It is. Um, we don't really know a whole lot, to be to be honest. The the gospels don't really delve into that. But of course, the empty tomb becomes the central point of the proclamation. We see this both in Paul's letters. We see this in the gospels. We see this in the book of Acts. That resurrection is really the bedrock of the proclamation that we find throughout the rest of the New Testament outside of the Gospels. And um, it, as we see with Paul wrestling with this in Athens, with the uh, in of the Areopagus, as we see this with in 1 Corinthians, where the Corinthians are wrestling with this, that the idea of the resurrection is something that is rather difficult within the Greco-Roman world. Um, It is absolutely an idea that emerges within ancient Judaism. Um, And therefore, it's something that is germane to that. As far as the Roman administration of Jerusalem and Judea, we don't hear a lot within gospel sources on that. So this was a comment. It wasn't really a question, but it was a comment. And I'd like to get your comments on the comment. Uh, It's from Clifton. James Kelly says, Pilate was a monster, but it worried him to kill an innocent man. What are your thoughts on that? I'm not sure that it necessarily worried him. I think that Pilate, part of why he wants to execute Barabbas is Pilate understands where Barabbas and his ilk are coming from, that they're not the ones that turn the other cheek. They're the ones who respond, you kill me, I'm going to kill you type of thing. And I think what this does is it gives Pilate potentially the opportunity to take the gloves off. He does say that he will have Jesus beaten, which we don't necessarily find Roman governor just randomly beating people. It's very interesting to note two things. Josephus mentions a number of prophetic figures who are calling upon people to come into the wilderness, and there they will give them the signs of their redemption. All of these movements he talks about, he ultimately says that the Roman governors send troops in, go after them. So the Roman governors are not unaware of the redemptive potential and the potential unrest that are created by these Jewish prophetic movements. At the same time, we actually hear a very similar story to what we see with Jesus, that there was another Jesus, a man by the name of Jesus, the son of Ananias, who a few years before the Jewish revolt breaks out, which culminates in the destruction of uh, Jerusalem and the temple in AD 70, this Jesus stands up at the festival of Sukkot, Tabernacles, and quoting Jeremiah 7, just like what we find with Jesus in the Gospels, predicts the coming destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. Once again, the chief priests take this individual to the Roman governor, who sees him as kind of this quack and just this, basically this prophetic loony, and has him beaten and released. This Jesus wanders around the streets of Jerusalem, continuing to lament its coming destruction, and then eventually during the siege of Jerusalem, he's killed. But it's very similar to what we find 
within Pilate's response to Jesus of Nazareth uh, in the Gospels as well. Let me beat him and then let go. But I think that part of that is being fueled for Pilate because he has a greater statement he's trying to make with the execution of Barabbas. So let's move to a, another question, and this one is related to uh, Pilate's wife. It was a really insightful question, I thought, from Joanne Garabe. She says, so sorry she came to this late, but what about his wife, Pilate's wife, who kept telling him to stay out of it, so to speak? What are your thoughts? I mean, we have this story in John's Gospel that, that his wife sends him a message and says, I've been troubled by a dream. Um, I think that part of what is going on here is the ancient world, especially the Roman world as well as the Jewish world, was very um, dreams and visions and heavenly signs were important to them. And they took those things seriously. And so I think that that is, is serving that purpose there in, in, in John's gospel, that um, it's ascribing this event with Pilate's wife saying, listen, you know, here's kind of a foreshadowing of this figure, of this individual. Remember, we also get the stories of the, the sun being blackened out, the ringing of the veil uh, in the temple. All of these things that we find are these kind of portents that were very important to ancient readers and were a way of signaling, hey, pay attention, there's something divine that's going on here. Right. Uh, here's one more, and this one is kind of uh, speculatory, but let's uh, ask it and see what your thoughts are. So from from Kyle Myers, again, not a question, but just a comment. I wouldn't doubt if Pilate converted at the end of his life. How likely do you think that is? Well, we do have in later traditions these ideas about Pilate's conversion, about, in fact, in a, in a certain stream of Christianity, you even have Pilate becoming a saint. Um, one, we don't, once Pilate is removed from power um, in Judea, we never hear about him again. We don't hear about him in any of the ancient sources. And we begin to see, particularly in the Byzantine period, the Christian Roman Empire, the, um, this presentation of a good old pilot. That, and part of that has to do with the fact that in the Byzantine period, it's kind of not good PR for the Roman Empire to say, yeah, the guy that we crucified is a criminal of the state, we're now claiming as God and as divine and so forth. And we begin to have certain aspects of that being cleaned up in the tradition. And, and part of the, the pilot stuff comes out of that. So this one is a question that I don't really know. Uh, I'm, I'm not familiar with the life of Brian, but Chris has a question. How accurate is the life of Brian's portrayal of pilot? Um, the, let me say this, it, although it has, it's, I'm not going to recommend it to all your viewers, but since the question is brought up, one of probably the best representations just in terms of the world of Judea in the first century that has ever been presented is what you find in the life of Brian, all the different factions and so forth. And yes, I think that they get some things right about Pilate that a lot of the Jesus movies have missed. Um, it's it's actually rather rather humorous, but again, I'm not sure that everyone will appreciate you know uh, a uh, a bit of uh, Monty Python's kind of presentation of the life of Brian there. But uh, historically and culturally, they nail a lot of things. Fair enough. All right. I think that's going to do it for us today. We're going to keep this episode short and sweet. So uh, I did want to mention that I would like to have you back on. And your specialty, again, is, is the origins of Christianity. So I want to let the audience know or really uh, question the audience. If you've enjoyed this interview with Mark Turnage, 
who again is working on his PhD, really exciting stuff. But if you'd like to see him back on to discuss something related to the origins of Christianity, let me know in the comments what you would like him back on to talk about. And yeah, just let me know. One of of the things that I'd be super interested to know, because you've been to Israel so many times, like maybe your top three, I don't know, interesting archaeological finds or something related to like the land of Israel that sort of corroborates the biblical accounts, that I think might be a really fun show to do. So uh, what are your thoughts? What what would be a good show uh, in, in your mind related to the origins of Christianity? Listen, I love to talk about uh, archaeology and how uh, archaeological discoveries can shed light on the world of the Bible. At the same time, I think that there's a lot to discover in terms of um, even like what we d- just did today, looking at the kind of historical and religious world um, of the Gospels, I think that it brings a depth and actually even brings a, a clarity to our modern conversations about Jesus, the Bible, the um, even even how do we. Uh, how do we deal with the the gospels themselves? Are mm-hmm. you know how do we work with them? And I think that those could be some very interesting conversations. So this is a super random question, but I was just thinking about I, again. I was just kind of going through my experience in Israel. One of my one of the things that sticks out in my mind was uh, they've got these caves underneath the 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 Temple Mount where you can go and you can see mm-hmm. like the pillars or like the old with the old is it the the foundations of the the first temple. Where you can like see it's it's crazy how big these stones were. It was like I don't some some people have even hypothesized that like angels were the ones who put these stones there because they were so big. But it, I just remember going down there and being like, man, it would have been so cool if the first century or if the first temple was was still around, uh, if it hadn't been destroyed. It what it, do you did you get that impression as well? First time you, I assume you've gone down there. It, did you get that impression too? Where you're just like, man, it would have been cool to see that. Well, I think what you're talking about are what are called the Western Wall Tunnels. Mm. And this is the continuation of the Western Wall. Everybody's familiar with the Western Wall Prayer Plaza that you have, which is a, a functioning synagogue today. And that is actually the Western Retaining Wall of the Second Temple. And, the Second Temple. Um, yeah. And so right, right, right. And there are. There are massive, in fact, the largest hewn stone in the world is there. Um, It's over 45 feet long, one single block of stone. And um, it is massive. And you're right, it is, it is fascinating. And to imagine, even when you go to Jerusalem, and you look at the very famous Golden Dome of the Rock and realize that the temple that Jesus and that Paul and that Peter knew was to get to the height of that temple, you would have to take the building of the Dome of the Rock and add another entire building of the Dome of the Rock on top of it. And then you begin to get a sense of the grandeur of this place. And imagine yourself as a pilgrim from Galilee, like Jesus as a young boy coming there and seeing these huge stones. And even the question that gets put to him by his disciples looking at these big, beautiful stones, and then he comes back and says, not one stone is going to remain on the other. Uh, It is. it is. It's it's an amazing thing to see and to be able to stand on those streets that are going back to the first century. And um, it it really does, in my mind, open up a lot of Jesus's interaction with Jerusalem. Here's another question. It's just off the top of my head. Do you... Because you're familiar, I assume you're familiar with uh, what are called Jesus mythicists who believe that the that, well, G- they just don't believe that Jesus ever existed. When you're over mm-hmm. in the in Israel itself in Jerusalem, d- did did you do you find that idea kind of like silly? I mean, just even if you even if we didn't have the the gospel accounts, is it? I don't know. Well, I, I, I no, I absolutely think it's. I, I there's no reason inherently to doubt it. We not only have the gospel accounts, but then you also have Josephus, you have, like I said, Cornelius Tacitus, and then very early on in the second century, we also have other um, Roman writers that are writing about this movement. 
And one of the things that I would say in terms of my work as a historian and someone who's trained in language, that the hyper skepticism that we find sometimes in the modern world as it relates to ancient sources, I don't think is, is founded because we often sit in judgment of the ancient sources removed from time, space, culture, and really, frankly, religious context. And one of the things that I find, even though, for example, our gospels are written in Greek, we see evidence of the gospels preserving, although they're written in Greek, preserving sayings of Jesus that go back into, that clearly go back into Hebrew. We find evidence of the Gospels providing us even some of the earliest record of actions that become normative within Judaism, that we don't find Jewish sources writing these things down for five or six centuries later, but the earliest mention of them is actually in the Gospels. And so the idea that this stuff is being created kind of willy-nilly just doesn't really make a lot of sense. Moreover, when we look at the genre of the Gospels, we're really dealing in the genre of ancient biography. And while ancient biographers had a certain freedom to architect their sources, especially if they were writing about something in the near past, the recent past, they were expected to, to have that grounded within some kind of a historical reality. Again, they got to work as the architect of telling their story. And it's they're not necessarily following it in a modern historian's um, uh, acumen, but they absolutely are not creating these things as myths. There was a completely different genre that the Greco-Roman world had if you wanted to write myth. Just go read Ovid's Metamorphosis as an example of that. And so I think when you begin to look at the Gospels and they're being written, even when you talk about being written down maybe 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, after Jesus, if we understand the world of ancient Judaism, we can look at this and begin to say, listen, we have good representation in the Gospels of a first century Jewish man who lived in the land of Israel. And again, you could, you know, ultimately, I guess you could argue, well, you know, that they were still just creating him as, as a figure um, out of thin air to be to populate these biographies, but that's not the way that that genre worked, and so I think that that has to be taken into consideration. All right, man, I want, uh, we could talk forever, but may, you know, maybe uh, maybe we'll have another show pretty soon here. So, uh, thank you guys for tuning in, Mark. Is there anything that you would like to leave uh, with the audience before we close it out today? Appreciate being on, Cameron, and thank you all for watching. And go check us out at windowsintothebibleuniversity.com, and uh, we look forward to engaging with you. I really like that name, too, Windows Into the Bible. It's a good analogy, too, And I, as I was listening to you explain it in your podcast. Podcast is good, too. Go listen to that. Go check out all the stuff that Mark is doing. If you've uh, watched up until this point, you're probably going to be interested to subscribe to this channel. That way you can get notified when we have new videos. Hit the bell, too. That's actually more important than subscribers these days. Thank you guys for tuning in and we will see you in the next Caption Christianity interview, video, debate, whatever. So see you guys next time.